Vítáme vás na dalším biologickém čtvrtku, který teda dneska bude anglicky a Robin bude dnešní přednášení představit. Ale nejdřív o známka na příště, to bude Petr Slavíček, nejsme jako oni, anebo jo, vědecké porody včera, dnes a zítra. Takže se máte na co těšit. A teď bych teda poprosil Robina. It's my honor to introduce you Konrad Tamlon Kamický uh, from Bělistok. He's from a, 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 a Commission Society of Unit. He's a philosopher of science and also uh, uh, going to scientists of religion. This talk will be about these, these topics that he holds here. He's an uh, Austrian slash Polish person and uh, also a friend. So. Thank you very much. Uh, How is it going? We come fast? Yeah? <laughs> no. uh, okay, I'm very happy to be talking to a group where there's a strong uh, biological contingent. I hope I don't say anything too stupid about evolutionary theory. Uh, I've already said to Hansa that if I do, the tape will come to me and I will burn it. So there will be no evidence available of anything too stupid that I managed to say today. All right, uh, so today I'm going to be talking about a fairly important, fairly broad area of research into the cognitive basis of religion, where religion is this broad and kind of ill-defined category. So of course we focus on, on ritual, which turns out also is actually quite broad and ill-defined, but uh, you know, that's the kind of thing you get when you're looking at biological phenomena, essentially, right? You get these kinds of problems, and social phenomena are essentially biological phenomena. So, the title uh, I got today for my talk is obviously referring to that famous or perhaps infamous book, uh, Fear and Loathing, in uh, Los Angeles, uh, which ended up being turned into a movie. Now, in all honesty, I won't be talking much about fear so much as a very closely related emotion, which is anxiety. Right? But if I was to call it anxiety and ritual in the modern world, but the reference would be worse. I took the liberty. You guys know what I'm talking about anyway, right? Okay, good. So, um, that is what I will be talking about today. Now, when I talk about anxiety and ritual, I like to begin with this guy here. The guy in white, doing a great impersonation of a British colonialist. It is an impersonation of a British colonialist. He wasn't British. <laughs> uh, was he a colonialist? Well, probably not. Uh, anybody willing to guess who this is? Except for you, you know. <laughs> anybody else? I do this to my students, right, in Poland. And I said, okay, who is this guy? They don't know. And I said, all right, this guy is as important in his field of science as Mary Curie Spodowska in her field of science and as Copernicus in his field of science. <laughs> and usually at this point, maybe one or two hands go up. It's Malinowski, Bronisław Malinowski, right? As indeed you started saying, of course, right? Uh, now he gets an appearance in this kind of talk for a very important reason. So he, he noticed something very, very interesting during his field work in the Trobri and the Islands. He noticed that the islanders fished either in the middle of atolls, because these are reef uh, islands mostly, so they have atolls, uh, or out on the open ocean. And depending on where they were fishing, their practices look very different. When they went fishing in the atoll, they would just jump in the boat, go out, fish, come back home. But if they went fishing out in the open ocean, 
before actually getting in the boat, there was a whole bunch of different magical rituals they had to perform. While they were in the boat, there were a bunch of taboos they had to observe. And again, there were further rituals to be performed when they got back. So, what he noticed was that, according to him, these ritual, these different rituals, had the, the effect of helping these people reduce their anxiety in situations that were dangerous. Because fishing in the Yazwell is not dangerous. Uh, even I could probably do it, right? And I'm pretty useless at these kinds of things. Fishing out on the open ocean, that is seriously dangerous stuff. Right? And in fact, he went further. He said, not only does it reduce anxiety, it has the function of reducing anxiety. Right? Now, in the ears of biologists, this takes on a particular note, a particular meaning, right? Which, of course, it didn't have when Malinowski said it. But we'll get back to this, because it is very important. Right, so anyway, he said that ritual has the function of reducing anxiety. And it's a way of thinking about ritual that has been very popular throughout the 20th century in a whole bunch of different scientific contexts. Right. So let's think about anxiety for a bit. Okay. First of all, it's an emotion which is very powerfully dysphoric. It's unpleasant being anxious. We don't like that. What do you get connected to? You get panic, panic attacks, depression, breathing problems, loss of libido, extreme fatigue, blood pressure. Right? It's bad for you. If you have long-term anxiety, it really does bad things to your system. Right? So, it has a bunch of negative effects on performance and on health. Right? So, getting rid of anxiety is a really good idea, doesn't it? Uh, in fact, we would do pretty much anything to reduce it when we do feel it. Uh, you know, some people try alcohol, some people try rituals. Right. So that sounds all good. The function of ritual is to reduce anxiety. Sounds all hunky dory, doesn't it? And here's a bunch of papers that say pretty much this. Right? First one how to handle anxiety, effects of reappraisal, acceptance, and suppression strategies on anxious arousal, where among suppression strategies is what? Ritual. Because you're not focusing on the problem, you're focusing on performing the ritual. Right? That's the idea. You're taking up your limited cognitive abilities with focusing on the ritual rather than on whatever's making you anxious. Great. Well, effective removing superstitious behavior and introducing pre-performance routine on basketball free throw performance. So looking again at rituals. Keep your fingers crossed how superstition improves performance. So, actual cases where if you do perform a ritual, it does improve your performance. Don't stop believing rituals improve performance by increasing anxiety, right? Exactly the hypothesis we've been looking at. This is all looking great and solid and unproblematic and wonderful. Anybody feeling a little bit anxious at this point? Anybody feeling like, I don't know, we've forgotten something? Like there's something sneaking up behind us about to hit us over the head? <laughs> don't worry, there was a very strong piece of glass between that kid and that, and that line, right? This is not, this is not. To end that badly for that kid. But good, right? He's perfectly happy. And hasn't noticed the line. And very soon it could end up very, very dead if it wasn't for the glass. Right? So, what's the problem here, right? 
Well, the problem is, okay, we've got anxiety. If it's such a horrible thing, why the hell has an evolution got rid of it? Why the hell do we feel it? Well, there's a very good reason why we feel it. Right? Anxiety is not all bad, shall we say. Anxiety has a function. Now, I'm wondering, uh, any sci-fi fans here? I, I know there are, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, who knows this guy here? He's not an anthropologist and he's not Polish. <laughs> <laughs> this guy here is uh, from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. This is Zay from Beeblebrox. He's the coolest person in the universe. Right? Sorry, in the galaxy, correction, in the galaxy. <laughs> right? And what makes him so cool? Well, these glasses here. Because you see, these glasses here, and I'll give you the full name in case you want to buy a pair. Uh, Joe Genta 200 Super Chromatic Peril Sensitive Sunglasses. They have the wonderful characteristic that when you get into a situation that's at all dangerous, they immediately go completely dark. So you cannot see the danger and you don't get stressed and worried and uncool. Right? Uh, yeah, you, you can imagine how well that goes, right? So, function of anxiety. Right? Fear, what we started off with, fear has the function of helping us deal with a present threat, which is right there. Anxiety, which is a little bit different, prepares us, prepares our body, prepares our mind to deal with potential threats. We're on the lookout for threats, we're ready to deal with the threats, you know, fight or flight, whatever. And it helps to, because it is so dysphoric, right? There's a reason why it feels so bad. So that we try and avoid situations where we get anxious. Because we're supposed to avoid behavior that leads us towards threats. So, anxiety is functional. On the other hand, of course, yes, it is damaging in the long term. Right? You can't be in this state of readiness for potential threats all the time. That's why anxiety kicks in rather than being present. And if it's present all the time, then yes, we get all the problems we saw on the previous slides. Right? So in fact, there's an interesting study. Uh, this is study here. Levels of anxiety and depression as predictors of mortality in Hunt study. I believe it was done on um, <coughs> data gathered in Norway. But what they found was that uh, in the population, if you had very high anxiety, that acted as a good predictor of our mortality. And if you had very low anxiety, that also was a good predictor of mortality. And so you actually wanted to be somewhere in the middle. Now, of course, there are lots of problems. You know, what's the correlation here? What's the causation here? And this is a population-wide study rather than blah, 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 blah. But you get the point. Get the point, get the picture, right? Too much, too little, it's both bad, and lacking it in the situation where you have a kid next to the glass is also a bad thing, right? So you want to have an anxiety at the right time. The problem is, if there's this complex relationship here, how does ritual affect this relationship? <coughs> Right? If it simply helps to lower your level of anxiety, this could be very far from functional. This could be very much dysfunctional. Right? Of course, looking at it from the point of view of what function means in evolutionary theory. Right? You die, you don't pass on your genes. You feel better in the meantime, so, from some points of view, that could be a positive result, right? 
but not the one that really matters. So, it seems that life is indeed complicated. Well, actually, no, sorry. Richard, especially Richard. Right? Uh, you can't simply say if, we dec if ritual decreases, the anxiety ritual is functional because anxiety is bad. That we have to have some kind of a balancing act here where the ritual has to affect anxiety in the right way, in the right circumstances. Right? So that there's a balancing act to play here, which is going to be quite complex. Right? So, let's, let's take a slightly different tack. Let's try things from a different direction. Okay? Um, I quite often show photos of Malinowski. Another scientist whose photo I quite often show is this guy here. I suspect there may be more recognition for this guy in this room than for Malinowski. Anybody? Sorry? Nicotine burger. Yeah, this is nicotine burger. Right? Now, he appears here uh, because of his four questions. The four questions that you have to ask when you try to explain any kind of behavior in an evolutionary framework. Right? Now, yes, I know there are problems with the way he frames that and, uh, and it's debatable and that. For somebody who's not seen this right smack bang in the middle of evolutionary theory, like myself, those questions nonetheless are very useful when I'm thinking about behavior. Particularly because here, rather than just focusing on the question of function, I'd like to focus on the question of mechanism. Right? The other, I'm sorry, not the other, but an other question that Tim Bergen says that we have to think about. Alright, so let's think about the mechanism which generates ritual, or more broadly, ritualized behavior. Okay, so another guy in a black and white photo. Anybody? It's Skinner. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, right? The pigeons are pretty <laughs> much a dead giveaway, right? <laughs> right. Um, yes. The reason why we have Skinner, of course, is because of his famous study on superstition in the pigeon. Right, where he argued that uh, superstitious behavior in the pigeon is the result of accidental operant condition. Uh, now, to use mentalese kind of language, the language of, you know, that assumes mental states, which of course Skinner would be very unhappy with, but I don't have a problem with, the idea being that the pigeon thinks that there's a connection between between its behavior and the appearance of food, where there is no connection. Right? Now, uh, a psychologist working in the Skinnerian tradition, uh, Stuart Weiss, put it quite nicely when he said that accidental operant conditioning isn't just for rats and pigeons. Right? We know this. But, okay, that's superstitious behavior. Uh, there are various ways of talking about ritualized behavior, but normally it's understood to be more complex than uh, what at least Skinner identified as superstitious behavior. So, here you have, first of all, a study done by Stuart Weiss on human beings to look at superstitious behavior in humans. And then we'll look at another study which is supposed to look at ritualized behavior. So here is the sort of Skinner box that Weiss invented. Uh, this is a computer screen. Uh, on the screen you have 
a 4x4 four four matrix. That's the cursor, that's the end point you're trying to reach, and you have two buttons, right and down. Okay? And the subjects in the study were told to you know, try and get as many points as they can by using those buttons to get the cursor to the end point. And they would use those buttons, and sometimes they would get points, sometimes they wouldn't get points. And Vice talked to them after this whole procedure and said, okay, so what was going on? And they said, well, okay, what was happening was that there was a rule that on the very first time you had to go down all the way to the bottom and go right, and then you get a point. Then on the second time you had to go and do something like this. Um, the third time, I'm not sure, I tried a few different things, but that didn't work. Uh, and then you go fourth time this way, and then I think it goes back to the first thing again, but I'm not 100% sure yet. If you just give me a few more minutes, I'll work it out. No. This is not what was happening. It was simply random. 50% chance of success. Okay? Practically nobody said that it was random. Practically everybody thought that there was a causal connection between the particular path they chose and whether they got points. Okay? So this is Weiss's study looking at uh, superstitious behavior and like superstitious beliefs in humans. As I said, this is a bit too simple to get what are normally considered to be aspects of a ritualized behavior. So, a slightly more complex environment is necessary. Instead of two buttons, you have five buttons. You have not just right and down, you have also up and left, and you have this button in the middle. Okay? And this has been moved in one. Right? That's the only difference. And again, People are told that they're supposed to get points by getting the cursor to the end square. Now, this study is actually being done currently, it's a series of studies that's being currently done by myself and Christine Lagarde, who's from the University of uh, Texas in Austin. And this is part of our project of Patentist Ritualization Anxiety. Okay. And what we're doing is, again, we're simply, at least in this version of the experiment, simply modifying chance of success. 100%, 70%, 30%, and 0%. I, I'm going to tell you guys, the people who end up in this condition, I feel so sorry for them. <laughs> because there's nothing, nothing they can do to get points. <laughs> and they try, and they try. We had one guy who basically broke out of the program and started looking at the files. <laughs> of course, we had to remove him from, from the, uh, from the uh, results we were looking at, but you know, they really tried anything to, to get those points. <laughs> so, I will explain to you in detail how we operationalize these things. But um, two sort of characteristics that you get in uh, ritualized behavior is first of all, girl emotion, which is behavior which doesn't, lead, doesn't seem to have a, an obvious uh, function, doesn't seem to do anything. But it's still deemed to be necessary for the whole ritual to function. Well, actually, I will tell you. Um, that's because it's so simple. It's pressing this button. That button doesn't do anything. Okay? It simply gets registered as being pressed. But some people insist that we have to press it to get points. So, is pressing this button connected to a lower probability of success? Oh, hell yeah. Right? 
uh, in 20% of non-exit attempts that worry about the details. But basically it becomes quite common here and it's basically non-existent in the hand percent condition. The other characteristic we've got here is repetition. Uh, here we, we operationalize the expressing the up or left button. Because that's simply extending the path so you actually end up going like this and like this. Yeah, which is it's redundant. The full name, the full name of, of the characteristic is repetition and redundancy. Right, it's redundant. You don't need that. Does that increase? Oh hell yeah. Uh, now I'm not bothering to show you the exact uh, probability of this being specifically uh, significant because basically when we uh, did the printout of the results and of the statistical analysis, all we saw was zeros. Right? Uh, very much statistically, statistically significant results. So what appears to be happening here, in effect, is at least certain aspects of racialized behavior seem to be essentially a cognitive byproduct of us trying to find a pattern, trying to understand what's going on in a particular situation. Right? where we don't know what's going on, where it's, in effect, impossible for us to uh, find out what's going on because it's actually bad. We keep trying. Right? All right, but, you know, apart from people maybe in the zero condition where they have no success at all, we're going to have to end up actually checking, you know, their, their physiological uh, indicators to see if they're feeling any anxiety. But there was no attempt to introduce anxiety here, right? So what about anxiety? Right? You've got appearance of this behavior, but you don't have any anxiety. Well, um, to reintroduce anxiety into the picture, because there's obviously a correlation between anxiety and ritual. Unless your theory can explain that correlation, your theory is not doing very well. Right? Well, to explain that, uh, I draw on the work of this scientist here. Uh, she's an evolutionary psychologist. Her name is Martin Hazelwood. And together with uh, David Bass, they've put together what I think is a lovely piece of theoretical work. Uh, error management theory. Okay? So now the basic idea of error management theory is very simple. The idea is that evolution isn't going to uh, try to lead to a situation where we make the fewest, all organisms in general make the fewest errors, but they make the fewest costly errors. So that the average overall cost of the errors that are made is as low as possible. If this means making more of the cheap errors, not a problem. You simply want to avoid the cost of this, right? So what's a stereotypical situation that this theory could be talking about? Well, a pretty stereotypical thing is, imagine you're walking through some grassland and you hear noise behind you, right? Well, uh, there are two kinds of errors that can be made here, broadly speaking. You could think it's nothing important, do it but it could be something dangerous, such as a tiger, in which case the cost is, well, you become lunch. Right? That's, that's a pretty high cost. If your future fertility drops to well, zero, right? Um, or, the other kind of error is, it could think that it's a, something dangerous, like a tiger, but it's just a wind. Right? So you have a false positive as opposed to a false negative. And then the cost is, well, you know, you get a little bit anxious, you run around a bit, you know, if your friends see you, they might laugh at you, and that's it. Right? The cost is much, much smaller. So it's much better to make the second kind of mistake than the first kind of mistake. Right? So, uh, this idea is also sometimes called the smoke detector principle. Right? When you have a smoke detector, it's usually set in such a way that 
it will hopefully always sound the alarm when there is a fire nearby, even at the cost of sometimes setting off the alarm when all you're doing is, well, you just boil a lot of water and you know, there's a lot of water vapor in, in the air or whatever. Okay? And there's a further thing which really gets us to the anxiety part. Because how you would set this smoke detector, how cautious you would be here, will depend on your estimate of how dangerous a situation you're in. Right? If you think you're in a dangerous situation, you're going to be listening. You're going to be very much on the lookout for that tiger. You're going to be saying, in effect, hell, let me have lots and lots of false positives. Let me think there's a, there's a tiger behind every second tree, so long as I do not miss one of the many tigers that are in this territory. Right? So there has to be a way of changing the settings. Right? Changing the settings in such a way that you are more attuned to the threats, potential threats, or less attuned to potential threats. What does this sound like? So let's think about those people in traditional societies, right? Think about the difference between when they're on the hunt and when they're in the village. Here, there's a Generally dangerous situation, here's the generally safe situation. So what's the psychologically available indicator we have of being in a dangerous situation? Anxiety. <coughs> Anxiety plays the role of that knob being turned to the right. Okay? So the basic idea goes, if you have a situation where there's a lot of potential threats, this leads to <coughs> increased anxiety. This increases the level of attention you're paying to potential threats. And that leads to <coughs> more of these false positives which leads to increased visualization. Right? So you get the connection <coughs> this way. Right? Not because the function of visualization is to decrease anxiety, but simply because increased anxiety as a byproduct increases visualization behavior. So one of the later things that we will be doing in our study is we'll be trying to make our poor subjects uh, anxious and uh, seeing whether that increases the level of ritualized behavior that they, uh, that they perform, that they exhibit in the game. Okay? But, you know, we're looking at a computer game, right? We're looking at people being worried about a tiger. Where the hell is ritual? I mean, you know, think about a ritual. You know, what does an actual real life ritual look like? It's miles away from that. I mean, here's an example. Right? This is Kava D. Kava D on the island of Mauritius. Uh, in as, as part of Kabaddi, rather, you get young guys who take sharp objects, stick them through their skin, you know, he's a whole bunch of sharp needles on his arm, he's actually put them through his arm. Uh, you see this orange? It's at the end of another sharp object which is actually put through his cheeks. Uh, that's, you know, bound on the end of that. Um, those are hooks. Those, those hooks are in his back. Uh, he's attached those hooks to ropes 
this guy should make sure that they are securely attached. Because what is he, going, is he going to do? Using those hooks, using those ropes, he's going to pull that altar. He's going to pull the altar to the top of the hill. Right? That's what a ritual looks like. Right? You look at that and go, what the hell does that have to do with what I've been talking about? Right? Well, obviously there's a lot of other things happening. Right? There's a lot of additional stuff which hasn't been thought about in the analysis that I provided. I don't think he's doing this also, it has to be said, I don't think he's doing this to decrease his level of anxiety. Right? I really don't. Um, in fact, there's very good work uh, done by the Sigalatas, which seems to indicate that what you have is most of the young guys who do this are from lower social uh, spheres. How can we sphere the lower? That doesn't sound right. Oh, anyway. And what happens is that if they manage to perform this, the whole family, the level of respect they get from society increases. So the function here appears to be something quite different, potential. Right? So you've got something like that here. Think about another ritual. This is an Australian Aboriginal corroboree. Right? The term corroboree covers many different dances, usually, where the dances can be performed as part of any initiation ceremonies and a number of other kinds of ceremonies that appear, at least on the surface, to have a whole bunch of other functions. Right? They appear to actually have functions. So what I said earlier about ritualization being a byproduct obviously doesn't mean that ritual can't have function. <coughs> right? We know about expectations. We know that uh, behavior, that traits, get recruited to serve a function. And this may well be exactly what's happening here with different rituals having different functions. Right? But here's another important thing. Right? That and that, that's not our environment. This is our environment. Right? Where we're sitting in the office at 7 o'clock in the evening because we haven't finished the report or whatever. Right? Doing administrative work. Right? Where Perhaps, arguably, possibly, that function of reducing anxiety, reducing stress, which is suggested, although I find it somewhat questionable, it is suggested that long-term stress, long-term anxiety is something more of a trait of modern society than in more traditional societies, that may actually be functional. Right? So, you know, what's going on with ritual in the modern world? Well, we, when we ask ourselves the function, does ritual have a function, we have to really say, well, which ritual? Alright? As I said, it's a very broad category. You're talking about all kinds of different behaviors. And you really have to focus in a bit more. You have to ask yourself the question, which environment? Right? Behaviors that are functional in one environment but definitely not functional in a different environment. So, is it possible that some rituals have the function of reducing stress in the modern world? Hell yes. But, you know, we come back to what I said originally, which is if they're doing that, 
they are in effect modifying a response which is already functional. So you're going to have to have some sort of complicated story going on here explaining how it is that they decrease anxiety in those situations where they should and do not decrease it in the situations where they should not. But then you go, hold on, but we looked at all those studies and some of those studies show that actually ritual improves performance. Right? So did we show this in the case? Well, of course not. Right? Just because in certain cases, in certain circumstances, it improves performance doesn't mean that overall it is functional. Right? That's a much bigger claim. What we had with the U curve, U curve relationship between anxiety and mortality, could perhaps be seen as pointing towards that, but that isn't showing that. Right? So, for, not just from the point of view of the organism, is it a difficult thing? It's also very hard from the point of view of the scientists that we're trying to show that. Right? Okay. Well, those of you who read carefully the title would have noticed that I said it's an evolutionary journey to the heart of a convenient misconception. So where the hell is the convenient misconception? Well, <coughs> let me explain. What we have here is a situation where scientists are looking in effect at ourselves. We as scientists are looking at ourselves. Right? And when we do that, there's a very powerful motivation to try and show that we are actually pretty rational and we're doing sensible things and so on and so forth. Right, so these little rituals that I developed, there's a motivation to show that actually they, they are a good thing, right? Uh, when I think about this, I always think about this guy here, Herbert Spencer, right? Who uh, was a 19th century British gentleman scholar. Scholar because you know, sociologist, uh, philosopher, a number of different things that he worked on, and who, of course, was an evolutionist, but not in the Darwinian sense. He was an evolutionist in the sense that he thought that human society progressed towards the very epitome of what humans could achieve, where what would it mean to reach the epitome of what humans could achieve? It would mean to be a 19th century British gentleman scholar. A very convenient misconception. Right? So, I mean, we've got a situation here. We're looking at ritual. We're looking at something very closely related to religion where Having convenient misconceptions is very, very easy. Here's an example of a, a ritual behavior connected to religion. Uh, these people are uh, Orthodox Christians on a pilgrimage to the mountain of Grabarka in Poland. Okay? At least part of the pilgrimage, they have. Uh, undertaken on their knees. And when you ask them about it, they, they say things, well, it shows our devotion. It shows our faith. It shows our psychological and physical stamina. Right? But that's not the only point of view here, right? Somebody can also look at this and go, this is completely irrational. These people are nuts. Right? But then, of course, you look at it from a scientific point of view and you go, hold on. 
We know what this is. This is ghostly symbolism. Right? They are showing that they are willing to pay the costs of being members of a social group, a green group, where the benefits will nonetheless be greater than the costs they are paying. So, you know, it's complicated, right? But here's the thing. Some scholars of religion like to think that, well, you know, if you have pro-social behavior, such as before, you know, engaging in costly signals, uh, this is going to be a moral thing because being pro-social means helping others, working together. This is all good stuff. Well, what's more pro-social than joining an army and being willing to defend your in-group? Right? This is very much pro-social behavior. This is uh, the 70th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. Uh, being celebrated on Red Square in Moscow. Now, insofar as I understand how Czechs feel about it, the Czechs, the, the Czechs feel pretty much the same as the Poles do. We see Russian army, we are not very positive about that. Right? Uh, going out and killing people in the outgroup is very pro social behavior. David Boas, sorry, not David Boas, David Sloan Wilson is ignoring that kind of stuff. Again, it's more complicated. Okay. That's what I'm trying to get across. So, yeah. Um, thank you very much for listening and uh, questions, please. <laughs>